Good morning. Uh, with us today, we have Bradley Gawthrop, who is an awesome all-around maker who's working on a few cool projects. But also, today, he's going to show us how to design an art PCB. Here so I what's am. What's up, Bradley? <laughs> Nothing much. How about with you? Not bad. Do you prefer Bradley or Brad? Does not, it does not pay to have a preference. Um, so I, I'm perfectly Why? happy with either one. It's one of those names where people are going to do what they're going to do. So uh, it just it doesn't pay to worry about it. Cool. So you're also known as Tall, Dark, and Weirdo on Twitter. Yes. Cool. So what do you get up to? What do I get up to? Well, by day, uh, I'm a, a mild-mannered electrical engineer for Conservify. And uh, we build uh, environmental monitoring hardware. So the kind of thing you throw in a, a waterproof box and stick in the Amazon somewhere to record uh, any number of things from water quality to weather to any relevant environmental data. And then they, they all have different kinds of radios in them to get that data back out to the people who are interested in it. So we're in the yeah. business of pushing the barrier to entry for environmental sensing down so that you can put those sensors into the hands of people who need them. Um, and more of them in the hands of even like field scientists who aren't necessarily cost restrained in the same way, oh. but where they can have, uh, you know, 60 data points instead of 20 for the same money. That's a huge difference for the actual publishable data. So that's conservify.org? Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. So what are we getting up to today? Well, I thought we'd talk a little bit about PCB art. You've got a badge competition going on right now, and yeah. I've got a little bit of that stuff going on as well, but um, I don't know, I've, I feel kind of like I'm interested in a weird little side corner of what interests people about this, because I'm not quite a badge maker, like most of my PCB art doesn't have a circuit on it, or if it does, it's just illuminating an LED. Um, my, my sort of long-term look at this is that I, I want to create things that hang on the wall. Wow, yeah. um, my, my planning horizon right now goes out to 12 by 18 art pieces um, made in low quantities that hang up. That's, that's wow, cool. the direction I'm <laughs> going to. a canvas rather than yes. a little... Like, I have a printing background. Years and years ago, I was yeah. a printer for, a long, for many years, uh, six or seven, I think. And so um, that, kind of, that kind of precision that PCBs have as an accident because they need it for making seven mil traces on seven mil spaces mm. really appeals to me because it has a huge, huge hunk of detail. So like when you see my stuff, there's almost never much of any interest on the silk screen layer. It's, it's almost all in the copper and the solder mask. Huh. Cause that's because that's more precise they're, or they're much more precise. They're registered more precisely and they're made with optical methods rather than as a silk screen. Super cool. So you've done yeah, some just... things in the past, like a, a one that's based on like cats from the, that viral video from eons oh yes ago. yeah i have one here somewhere here we go oh, cool i did uh, all your base yeah <laughs> this is a reject all your base we're actually going to talk a little bit about this because um oh, cool. registration is a big thing right um this is one where i relied on the silk screen to carry the image and this is mm. why you don't want to do that because like it doesn't matter to a PCB manufacturer whether the silk screen lands exactly where you've drawn it when they're making PCBs for people who really are doing circuits and stuff. Right. Like, stuff. So like if it moves a half a millimeter, no one usually gives a damn. <laughs> um, so if you count on them to keep your registration, that's the best way I know to make sure that they won't, right? Like if you, if you make a design that counts on it being perfect, they'll be all over the place, even within a run, which is weird. I don't know what, I don't know where that variance is that it changes within a run. Yeah. Like I got a hundred, I think of the, all your baseboards and about 50 of them, I would agree to give away. Oh. Uh, the other ones I have, you know, in here as shims for setting up and like stenciling and stuff. <laughs> um, and I mean, they weren't expensive and I didn't mind. It was an experiment to see, you know, how that would go, mm. but it's, it re it reaffirmed my desire not to use the silk screen layer for anything that's placement particular. Mm. Um, because it just they, it does not land where you expect it to land uh, necessarily. But yeah, I did that, and I did um, I brought Gur to Super Conference this year. Yeah, Gur is so wow. great because you're using that. Is that it's not the unique coding? What's the other one called? Uh, uh, this is uh, HASL Hot Air mm -hmm. Solder Leveling. 
So it's, it's just, uh, it's just been coated with the least little bit of solder, which makes it shiny and silver. So shiny. And it is shiny. And I was kind of surprised. I didn't know how well it would hold up and they seem to do okay. Um, and this one has a couple of reverse mount LEDs on it, but unfortunately I don't think I have a battery here to plug it in and make its eyes glow, but it's eyes. Oh, glow. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta have glow, but, yeah. yeah. This one, like I was more careful. We can actually pull it up on the, on the screen in a minute. I was more careful to make sure that the placement of the black didn't matter all that much. Like if it drifts around, like it still looks kind of okay. So that's using a black silk screen. Yeah, this is a, this is white solder mask and a black silk screen. Oh. And then, uh, and then just HASL for the pads. Um, it very much confuses PCB manufacturers when yeah. this kind of stuff <laughs> gets pre-flighted. They're like, really? Like you mm. almost always have to do some handholding. Um, to get them through, PCB Way made these for me, and with a little bit of um, a little bit of cajoling, they were fine. The quality is actually really nice. That's an um, interesting stipulation that it's not all technical challenges. Some of the challenges are human. Well, some of them are, are just plain communication because, like the the sort of challenges that they're used to dealing with through the language barrier mm -hmm. uh, at your average PCB fab are things where you can point at a component and say it's the wrong way, or you know the pad has been covered by a solder mask or something like that. And so, like if you're trying to say no, no, it's supposed to look like that. It's an art piece. You know, <laughs> in in two or three years, I suspect that will no longer be a surprise, but it's yeah. still kind of a surprise. I imagine the weirdness of the things that people are seeing in those uh, settings is significantly moving forward right yeah. now. So it'll be easier, I think, in a little while than it is today. But right now, there's still a lot of, what the hell are you doing? Why yeah. does the circuit not make any sense? These pads don't go anywhere. They don't route to anything. Um, because to them, it just looks like their pre-flight process is broken. Like they have shit Gerbers that aren't gonna make what people want. Right. Don't want to ship that even stuff like out. if you're trying to work in the PCB software, that can also be like, you're not allowed to do this. Oh yeah, totally. I the PCB to. software is so not designed for this. Yeah. Um, so what's your process like? Can you show us? Yeah. Let me, uh, let me flip this around so I can show you what's going on here. Sweet. Here we are. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> I, uh, with a printing background, I tend to be a vector kid. So I work in Illustrator and this is a ah. million year old version of Illustrator to match my uh, million year old workstation. But um, the thing about PCB software is that at the end of the day, it all compiles to Gerber. And Gerber as a format is crap. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's good at doing circuit boards, like it's, it's the middle of its uh, you know, range. But what it's not for is uh, illustration or printing or anything remotely like that. It's just not very good at it. So like it does not support compound pads. So like if I if I if in Gerber I want to specify a donut, uh -huh. and I say oh here's here's this circle which I'm going to fill with an ugly color, uh -huh. and then I want to knock a circle out of the middle of it. Oh, like that is no problem for design software. It does this every day, mm -hmm. like that. Uh. Gerber has no way in its language to specify this. Mm. <laughs> there is no way to overlap two paths and say one of these knocks the other out. Yeah. So there are also no serious ways of doing curves um, that are appropriate. Like they're all specified as sort of subsections of circles, huh. which is mathematically nasty to try and work out from Bezier curves, which is what illustration software uses. Yikes. Um, it's, um, it's just sort of universally an ugly format to try and do this kind of work in because it's just not what it was designed for and the standard is a million years old. So you end up having to either manually or with clever software go into all the compound shapes like this and actually slice them open somewhere. So you end up cutting them, I'll do this manually just as an illustration. You end up, uh, cutting them with a shape. Hmm. Almost like if you were doing a stencil. Yeah, exactly so. So hmm. like if you cut all this stuff up like this and you do that programmatically, like it doesn't look any different in the output stage huh. because they fit together exactly right. But you end up with something that doesn't have a closed path in it anymore. You've got two 
completely closed segments that don't overlap anything else. Mm. So that's what ends up being required for this job. Now, that job for in my workflow is done for me by a clever script. Um, and actually, I made a video about this that we should link to so that we don't. Oh, that looks so cool! Hit all of the details, but um, there's a script that I helpfully didn't keep the window open because I wasn't thinking. Um, there's a script that goes through and takes SVG files and slices them open for this purpose. Hmm. Um, Did you write the script? No, I have contributed to its repo hmm. um, because I wanted to make some changes. Like as it, uh, there it is. As it comes, it was actually written by the guy who does uh, Espruino, the JavaScript on oh, micro yeah. platform. He wrote this script. Um, and you just feed it uh, an SVG file, and it spits out a script that you can run in Eagle uh, that draws the shapes out. Um, and it works pretty well, but it, it Eagle doesn't handle the complexity very well, so there are a number of workarounds that are required. So that's what we'll... That's what we'll talk about. So if I'm starting with art like this, this is um, the base PCB and copper, wow. and then solder mask, and then silk screen. <laughs> and you can see the silk screen, like it could drift around, and that would be no big deal. Mm. If it, you know, landed down there, meh, it still works. So it's kind of durable in that sense, which is important with silkscreen because you never know where the PCB manufacturer is gonna land it. Yeah. So what I will do, I work in the actual layers uh, that are gonna go on the PCB just to keep my own head straight um, and to make it look right, like the solder mask layer in here is slightly transparent so I can see the copper through it because that will be true of the real thing as well. Oh yeah. So like these are all the copper traces underneath which I've just specified as being kind of a pale, pale gray, nearly white. Um, so when I put this over it, it actually looks more or less like the real thing will look. And so cool. that's, that's super helpful. The drawback of that is that that's not actually what the software wants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you get into what the software really wants to see, solder mask is a reversed layer. It's actually stop. Right. Um, it's called T-stop for the top layer because what it is, is it wants a polygon where you don't want solder mask to go. Hmm. So that creates an extra step for me where I have to go through and reverse this out at the end. But it's helpful while you're actually drawing and stuff to have it looking like it's really going to look so you don't confuse yourself and paint yourself into a corner because it's surprisingly easy to do. Huh. Um, so I prepare a file all like this until it's ready to go and then I'll... I'll do what in the printing days would have been called separations, which is going through and preparing the files for the individual layers out as SVGs. And that's uh, a little bit fussy. So we'll do it with, um, we'll do it with the solder mask layer. We're gonna pretend that this is like a copper mask or a copper layer, even though it's not just to show how the process works. Mm. Um, let me hide everything else, okay. So the first thing that I would do, and I can't, tell if it's been done to this one or not, but we'll do it again if it hasn't. If this was all still curves, um, Gerber doesn't like curves, so I would add anchor points to it um, over and over again many, many times until it was just ludicrously uh. detailed. And the ones of these that are not necessary will end up uh, going away. Huh. Uh, apparently running out of memory. <laughs> uh, so then I would go in and do a simplify with straight lines selected and specify some curve precision. So it's going to go through and decimate all those uh, dots that are not necessary and smash everything else down into straight lines so there are no curves left in the path. Cool. So it's going out like an old school DXF, right? Like all straight lines. Mm. Um, but it, it knows where to leave them in and where to, um, where to decimate them because you've specified an, an angle precision two degrees is usually enough uh, mm. to capture the sort of detail that we're talking about. And then uh, this is fairly simple. If it was complicated and sometimes even when it's not, I'll draw a grid over the whole thing 
to break it up into a bunch of points. The, uh, the, total, the total complexity of a single polygon that you can get um, is not great <laughs> in this process. So like, I like to break it into a lot of pieces with Pathfinder like this. So that like it's bunches of little puzzle pieces. Ooh. Because that makes any individual uh, polygon very simple, right? It's unlikely to have any more than seven or eight points in it. Right. And so I do all of that and then I get the empty ones and delete them. So what you've got is Whoa. like a jigsaw puzzle of whatever the working layer is. And that's the point at which I, I export it and bring it into the script. Um, it's not always necessary. Like this, as a complete work of art, this has like 191,000 points in it, which is a lot. Um, so like if you're doing a basic logo or something or something you know, more straightforward like uh, the GER badge was, um, or all your base is just actually weirdly efficient because I left it pixelated. So it, it is in fact all squares. Right. <laughs> Which makes the polygons real simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that may not need this kind of approach, but when you do start getting into crazy stuff like this, which you don't see very often, um, oh, I should make a pixelated Archie now. Oof. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, he's not actually pixelated. He's just been cut up. Because mm -hmm. once you get down, like if I wanted to do this the easy way, the easy way is to feed it into one of a million scripts that would actually rasterize him and just turn uh -huh. him into a bunch of rectangles. Like right. that's what the import scripts for Eagle do if you feed them images or logos, right? Is they rasterize it all at a given resolution. I don't like doing that um, for a couple of reasons. I don't like the quality that it produces. The resolution is almost never high enough. Mm. It produces a very messy file. Um, the files tend to be huge even by my standards. Um, I don't, I've never cared for that rasterizing approach, though it is like the de facto industry standard. If you mm. pop open PCBs that have art on them from uh, Adafruit or whoever, like if you open up the Grand Central's uh, uh, PCB, which I had open just the other day because I was uh, learning from Lemoore's amazing routing. Cool. Uh, like the, uh, the PCB art on that board, which is a really pretty board, um, is all has all been rasterized. They they drew it and they rasterized it out, um, and it gets printed on the board that way. Now they have a lot of say in their manufacturing methodology, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're very good friends with their fab house, so they can they can get away with stuff like that. But for me, um, I like to uh, I like to keep things in the vector world when I can. So a file like this will get fed to the script. We'll specify a name for it, and if it's a copper layer, uh, you'll specify what net it's part of. Hmm. Otherwise, Eagle will ask you um, about every polygon. What oh net boy! It's part of, <laughs> which is uh, essentially an infinite loop. It's not really infinite, but it's functionally infinite. Yeah. So I can Eagle. pop open. Uh, let's see. Just for demonstration, we'll do the. Silk layer because it's simple. We're gonna do the Julia Child. Here's one I prepared earlier. Thing <laughs> needs more butter. Hello, everything needs more butter. True. It's the secret to cooking. Mm. All right, so it's gonna chew on that for a minute. Um, this is not a super fast machine, though it was considered so in its time, but also JavaScript is not what one would think of as a performance platform for this kind of work. It's also so cool I, that they made a little HTML interface for it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is, it's all in that HTML file. It's not cool. even just the interface, like the whole thing runs in browser. Wow. Which has upsides and downsides. Um, in the end, we will end up copying gobs of text out of a, a form field in this HTML file and pasting it into the actual file that we feed to Eagle, which is not Ooh. super duper elegant. <laughs> but, you know, you use the tools you have to hand, so. Totally. My contribution to this repo while it's sitting here chewing on it was just um, adding a field for a signal name that mm -hmm. was originally not supported because people were almost always putting stuff in the uh, silk screen layer where it doesn't matter. Oh, like yeah don't have a signal. Um, and so every time I would try and put stuff in copper, I was facing this endless loop of, hey, what signal? Hey, what signal? Hey, what signal? Oh, no. 
I was like, oh, this is going to be a pull request. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in and, uh, and changed that, and the, uh, the author very graciously merged it for me. So which of the Metro boards are you talking about? Are you talking about the Metro M4 or the Grand Central? The Grand Central uh, is the one that has beautiful art on it. Um, mm. I can actually pull it up here because I have the other browser uh, is perfectly happy to run while this one is log jammed. Ooh, look at the 328 there. Oh, yeah. Wow. The back has this gorgeous. Wow. Isn't that cool? That is so cool. I had no idea. So, like, it's got this crazy uh, at Samby 51 on the front, uh -huh. uh, which is 0.4 millimeter pitch, right? Like, it's a it's a beastie. Yeah. yeah. 128 pins. Wow. And because oh, Lamore yeah. is a steely eyed missile woman, that <laughs> board is still a two layer board. <laughs> wow. Like, they have routed that whole thing in two layers. And um, I was, uh, somebody was asking me about whether they should go to four on a project that they were working on. And I'm like, well, it depends on how much time you want to spend. If you want to be, you know, just incredibly OCD about it, you can probably get away with two. They're like, oh, well, I have all this stuff. I'm like, no, no, no. Let me, let me show you what all this stuff looks like. <laughs> go look at the way that this board is routed because it's amazing. And it, it genuinely is. Um, I think Lamore is still doing all the board layout over there. Mm. Um, but whoever laid this board out, I'm pretty sure it's her. Um, is really just exceptional. It's it's an amazing piece of work. It's uh, it's an education. One of the reasons why I like open source hardware is because you get to sort of stick your fingers in the guts of other people's work and see how they're doing stuff. Yeah. Uh, in this case, like lamore has been using Eagle since you know since I was a, a babe in arms. So uh, not not really. She's not that much older than me, but <laughs> she's been doing it a long time, and she spent so many hours in it that she's just got an eye and it's a it's amazing to go through her boards and just see how well everything is put together just the the level of thought that she gives to that stuff like to keep her manufacturing costs down it's obviously nice to be two layers but it's also nice for her to have nice fat traces so like this is 0.4 millimeter pitch so she breaks out seven mil lines from there but then she fans them out and they get fat almost immediately. Right. She breaks them up to 10 mils uh, as soon as they're a little ways away from the chip so that her yields stay up. Hmm. Um, that sort of stuff is just a, just amazing. It's just experience uh, on her part. Oh, wow. This look has at come that. Through. I want this on a t-shirt. That's amazing. I know, right? The, the one of the copper of this looks really cool. I almost screenshotted it and sent it to you just because it was so trippy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it lets you see where all of the, the different you know, polygons border each other and that it has caught them all and that they are correct. Wow, super rad. Barfed a huge amount of <laughs> script into this text box, which we, you know, can capture and then paste into whatever's handy. I usually use Atom um, and then just save that out into the file, that, into the format that Eagle uses to do its scripting in. And then you just run those scripts back to back and you end up with something like this. Now, once in a while, and I don't, I haven't tracked down where this error is yet. Uh, something about the way that the the polygon interpretation is being done. Occasionally, this script will spit out polygons with four points that all have the same coordinates on them. Oh no! Um, and Eagle will cry. Mm -hmm. um, you'll you'll be running the script, and it'll be like on line X, there's a bad polygon, mm. and so. You can actually easily just go in and remove those. They don't actually affect anything, as you might expect of a polygon with four points. They're all on top of each other. Yeah, because it'd just uh, be so, a point, right? Right. <laughs> so, like, there's nothing nothing to draw, right? There's That's no weird. there there. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, sometimes you have to go through uh, with uh, an editor and, and knock a few of those out if you're dealing with something really complicated. Again, this is, like, 190-odd thousand points. So this is... The very large uh, PCB projects have many fewer points in them than this one does just because uh, it's uh, it's pushing the envelope a bit. But you can see that it comes through in the manufacturing view and looks right. And uh, this file could be uh, cammed out and uh, prepared for manufacture, and we're gonna, because uh, I want to uh, to make some and uh, send yeah. you some. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of what my process looks like. And again, the details are in the video. You can you can link to it. Um, it's a process sort of bounded in by weird uh, details that you have to pay attention to. And I have to wash these SVG files through 
Inkscape because of the way that Illustrator deals with color in its SVG files. Hmm. And it's like in general, just kind of a format nightmare right now, which I, I'm, I am assured by people in a position to know that uh, Eagle is getting proper vector import um, and that's on their roadmap and that they're working on it. Hooray. Um, and when that happens, uh, life will get easier for everybody. The process is similarly ugly on the KiCad side right now. Like again, it's easy if you want to rasterize, um, mm. but if you actually want to keep your vector art vector, it's a mess. Um, I have crashed. I mean, I'm on the Mac, so KiCad crashes if you look at it sideways. <sighs> platform, it's a lot better in Windows. Um, but even uh, even on Windows, I have never been able to make anything of this complexity come into KiCad without crashing. Mm. Um, and the scripts that are supposed to convert from one to the other are also uh, things that I have uh, taken great delight in uh, smashing to little tiny bits. <laughs> so um, I use both KiCad really and nice Eagle like every day. I don't particularly have a dog in the fight um, there to the extent to, the, to which there's a fight. Um, but um, for this, um, KiCad just won't do it mm. um, at this point, uh, not in my experience. By the time you get much over you know, 15 or 20,000 points, KiCad just chokes and dies. Um, it's just not prepared for that. Mm. So we'll see. I mean, I, I would like to see that get better. At the point at which real busier curves are possible, you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of points to represent something like this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully you'll have weird, or le fewer of these weird situations where things crash because they're just, everything is so much bigger than anyone ever thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm hopeful that this process will all get easier and I'm weird enough that some part of me will probably miss it when those limitations start going away. I mean, constraints bring creativity, right? Yeah, I mean, I remember Brian Benchoff was talking at uh, at Super Conference about how he thinks that in the long run, probably four color process is coming to PCBs, hmm. um, and that that will enable a lot of interesting PCB art. And like, I I'm so torn about that because at the point at which you can just sort of draw anything and have it printed on the face of a PCB, for me, it's not any fun anymore. Mm. <laughs> like, that's just not. It's not really the way I work. Like, I love being constrained by medium in ways that make me think of um, different kinds of art, right? Like Yeah, it's like it's this, really its own genre of art right now. Uh, yeah, it, it, the constraints make you make stylistic decisions that are interesting. Mm. In this case, it dovetailed in with like these curves are generated by, um, this is put together in 3D software in uh, Max and Cinema 4D. And I was wondering ago, about that. How you yeah, that. years ago, I had developed a bunch of um, very mathematically messy shaders for doing this kind of quasi engraving stuff where it would take a line and shoot it clean across the, the scene from one side of the camera to the other mm. and change its thickness based on the things that are happening underneath it. Um, what the illumination was that was under it, the angle of the thing that was under it as related to the camera, and that it would be it would be durable through noise. So you could take what started out as straight lines, distort them with some kind of mathematical noise, which you can see has been fairly subtle in here, but it's obviously they're not straight lines. Mm -hmm. um, and then do those transformations about the scene underneath to those lines after the noise hits, so it still lines up um, neatly to the edges. And the fact that I was doing PCB art just reminded me that I had done all that fussy shader nonsense years ago. Plus you shader nonsense. It's the title of the video now. <laughs> there you go. Um, because like what, what you need is something that reproduces well in the engraving sense. This is essentially like a photo engraving process, right? Like yeah. it's, it's done optically and then photo etched. Right. Um, and so you need something that can convey some 3D data, but you can't really shade and half tones are kind of shit. Um, so like, it's really hard to convey three dimensional shapes this way, unless you can come up with some way to abstract them. So that's what we ended up with. Awesome. So what's the next step here? Well, at this point, this is ready to go, uh, into cam. So like I could, uh, I could come over here and produce files to send to my PCB maker and watch the system scream and cry. <laughs> so what you've done uh, in theory here is that you've, or I guess in practice, but off screen, <laughs> you have yeah. um, pulled in the copper layer, the silk screen layer, and the solder mask layer. Uh, and, and a board outline. As well. Oh. And a board outline. Yeah. Which is, uh, which is the other one. So yeah, I, I washed those all through the export process in Illustrator to SVG. 
Uh, I popped them open in Inkscape and assigned them a color and mm. saved them again, which is really dumb that you have to do that. But <laughs> this, the, the, the inside baseball reason why that's required is because Illustrator doesn't actually treat anything in SVG as if it has a color. Um, it draws all its paths and then it assigns colors to them with styles. Um, Interesting. And the script that does the conversion from SVG to the Eagle script format throws away anything that doesn't have a color associated with it because it assumes that its guidelines are other non-printing stuff. Mm. So it, it will read an Illustrator SVG file just fine, but it also throws out 100% of what's in it because it all looks blank. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. So, I have to open it up in Inkscape and assign colors to everything. Um, any color will do just to make it visible to the script. That's so weird. So yeah, there's lots of, you know, again, this is kind of nightmarishly wonkish territory for, uh, for technical stuff. No, uh, no non-technical artist would tolerate it. Um, <laughs> that's why you love it though. Thing. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Like I love this <laughs> space where you have to have some of both. Um, it reminds me of the early days of the web, where like in order to have a web page, even on you know a shared platform like the old you know GeoCities and stuff, you had to have a certain amount of technical competence. Yeah. Um, like you you had to have an aesthetic sense, but you also had to have technical skills, and that's where PCB art is right now. Yeah, and I kind of oh sorry, on. <laughs> I was just gonna say I sort of appreciate that trapdoor in it that it requires you to be multidisciplinary. And that's because it kind of is two things smashed together, like visual art and technical PCBs. Like, it's still at that point where they're kind of two disciplines coming together. Yeah, and I'll be interested to see whether the PCB makers get fed up um, <laughs> at some point. Like, I, I expect no, to see are. in the next, well, yeah, I expect to see in the next couple of years that some of those houses who don't know how to quality check and kind of pre-flight this kind of stuff will say, you know, real honest to God active circuits only, please. Um, because this is probably, this kind of thing is probably a disproportionately high amount of their customer handholding. Mm. And I don't know that it's making them huge amounts of money. Yeah. <laughs> so they're probably pretty small runs. Yeah, they're, they're small runs. They're sometimes, they're often fussy PCBs uh, in all kinds of different ways. I mean, the nice thing about this is like, I am not sweating the details of the copper layers in here, right? Like, I don't have to make connections to 0.4 millimeter QFNs with any of this. Mm. Um, so like if their process doesn't quite perfectly hold, that's no big deal, but they don't know that, right? Like they don't, they don't have a way to do this, to do their quality control for art. Yeah. <laughs> Although who knows, maybe, uh, this will inspire some companies to start having more precise silk screening. Yeah. I would love to see a specialty house come along that was doing optical silk screen instead of, uh, actually doing it with silk screen. Like mm -hmm. you can order that as a special order thing. Essentially it's just another layer of solder mask that they mm -hmm. mask out the same way. Uh, and that was paying attention to that sort of thing and was catering to badge makers. Uh -huh. I don't know if you could make money at it, but it would be interesting to see someone try. Yeah. I used to do silk screening, um, for t-shirts and things. And <laughs> it'd be interesting to just like take a, uh, whatchamacallit, panel of PCBs and like stick them under a screen and like do a multi-layer colory thing on it. I feel like... A couple of people have tried that trick. Um, mm -hmm. The difficulty of it is that is in finding a material you can get to go through the screen that will live through reflow. Oh. It's like that was what I asked Brian Benchoff when he started doing all the pad printing. Yeah. Where he was putting like little lips and stuff on the, the Tindy mm -hmm. Kiss Badge. Little Kiss Badges, um, yeah. I'm like... Why, why are you pad printing? It seems like the worst process ever to try and do is he's like, well, the stuff you can get that you can feed to pad printers will survive going through a reflow oven. Oh <laughs> the other stuff, not so much. So I'm like, oh, that had not even remotely occurred to me. So yeah. yeah, you have to do a lot of sort of material science head scratching, I think, to make that work. I, I suspect there's something out there that you could silk screen that would survive that process, but you'd have to go and find it. and You'd spend a lot of money doing it. Yeah. Because most of that stuff is sold, you know, by the gallon only. <laughs> so mm. like, you're going to have a large graveyard of uh, used materials attempting to figure that stuff out. Yeah, or just go full Osh Park and choose one signature color. Yeah, I think the, uh, the better bet than actually silk screening on them, I think, is to find somebody who's just willing to do any number of optical solder mask layers because the materials already exist for that. Yeah. And, 
Is and there anything that technically attention. limits you from putting solder mask on top of solder mask? I don't think so. I mean, it's probably from the circuit standpoint, it might be a little awkward. Like it has a thickness. So if you start piling it up near ICs and stuff, like you could probably make ICs sit a little wonky on the board. Like they would sit up on the little hill of solder mask if you had applied huge amounts uh, to it. So you'd have to pay attention. But uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any theoretical reason why you couldn't do three or four colors if you, know, you were willing to pay someone to go through the process for you. It's exorbitant amounts of money. <laughs> well, and especially if they're going to pay attention to the registration because right. suddenly you know, that, that setup process can turn into a real nightmare for them. I think you couldn't do it, I think, with the sort of equipment that's currently being mass produced for the job. You'd have to, you'd have to build some custom kit. So whoever goes down that road is going to have you know, a half a million dollars of upfront expenses figuring out how to do it before they figure out whether there's enough of a market to make it back. Right. And that's, that's a, a tricky place to be in. But a lot of that, that whole section of the industry, not just as it relates to PCB art, but sort of in general, small scale electronics manufacturing is due to get kicked in the ass. Um, <laughs> in a good way, right? Like, yeah, disruption. disruption. Yeah, so many of the problems that we have, I mean, I'm in this situation with Conservify, right? Like Conservify is not in a situation where producing five or 10,000 of anything we make um, fits the problem that we're trying to solve, right? Like eventually we might be in the, in the business of making five or 10,000 of something, but like a lot of the most interesting problems for electronics to solve right now are in that medium scale that's terrible to produce. Right. It's more than 250 and it's less than 2000. Um, and lots and lots of projects from badge life to environmental this or prototype that or things for you know geeks like you and I to play with, um, a lot of that stuff falls into that quantity range and we're gonna have to get much better at producing in those quantities than we are right now. We need options we haven't got. Right. Um, because it's too much for tweezers. And <laughs> not enough for pick and place machines. Yeah, uh, I mean, there is the like open PNP that's going on now, but even that is like a huge amount of effort for a, an organization or a person. I love that open PNP exists in the world, but it's sort of where KiCad was years and years ago. Hmm. Like they have a long list of things they want to do and they don't really have the resources. I mean, building a pick and place machine is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I mean, pick and place machines also have serious limitations to them in that sort of form factor, right? Like I can, I can spend $4,000 and buy a 30 feeder charm high pick and place machine that doesn't suck, mm. but it doesn't really solve that problem because the thing about pick and place machines is when you pay someone for short run production on a pick and place machine, what you're really paying them to do is set the machine up and set the job up. Huh. The amount of time it takes to do that is much longer than the time it's going to take it to run the job, right? Like your your whole economic situation is is dominated by what in printing we used to call changeover, which is you know changing out the paper and getting the file loaded right. up, and getting everything calibrated because the machine runs so fast. Like even cheap ones, they're like two thousand parts an hour. Well, <laughs> I heard for that. Oh yeah, I heard for that reason it's often cheaper to get things printed in CMYK instead of just black and white because yes. just the changeover. Yep costs more than yeah the they, they will simply run it with the other wells just sitting there and not actually printing anything I've, I've seen it happen any number of times um that a lot of that business used to go to essentially copy machines like direct to image xerox machines and stuff like that when i was in the mm -hmm. business um and digital digital press is now replacing a lot of that stuff and it's the same way but the, this is the big problem in electronics as far as as I can see right now, is how we deal with this span between low hundreds and low thousands, where so many of the interesting problems are, but there are no good solutions for manufacturing. Um, and it, it went from being something I was very interested in to something that was in the middle of my job, because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right where Conservify is. Right. Um, so it's- um, Seems like it's, the perfect time to join then. Yeah. Um, it, it actually, it's a perfect job for me in lots of ways. I'm really happy to be there. It's good people doing good work. It's nice to use your superpowers for good. Um, yes. I had some, some offers I was not excited about um, in, uh, in sectors I would not be excited to work in. Uh, engineers all over, you know, experiencing that. Like, do you really want to go to work for defense contractors? Do you really want to 
you know, do law enforcement, um, all of those, all of those things are present. But yeah, they have really interesting problems to solve. And that's, that's enough to get me into a job usually. Fantastic. So before we wrap up, I wanted to show people the Conservify website again. Uh, or, and also, actually, if you have anything that you'd personally like to show off. Uh, the idea was that the, uh, the website that I run, The Accumulator, was going to start picking up all that stuff. But then I, I got to where I had two jobs. Uh, yeah, that, originally, I just stashed the conference talk materials there from uh -huh. the talk I gave at Super Conference two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was going to be bigger than that. And then it just, uh, my, my life swallowed it up because I ended yeah. up. It happens. Well, but yeah, follow me on, on Twitter if you're interested, and my stuff always comes along there. Cool. And then we have this website, which is just conservative.org. And then, of course, we have hacks.io slash contest slash badge love, which is going until the end of March, and you can win $5,000. But more importantly, you can have an impetus to finally build that project that you've been really excited to make uh, with PCB art and uh, share it with the world and win something cool. And honestly, as a maker myself, I find that just having an external deadline is really helpful. <laughs> so go ahead and check that out. Uh, By all means, and uh, we should link the, uh, the YouTube video that I did on this process that we just talked about. Yeah, it has huge, uh, huge numbers of details. Oh, fantastic. Uh, bringing vector artwork into Autodesk Eagle, and it's, it's under the accumulator, so when, when you see my little- uh, Oh, cool, yeah. Little mm -hmm. thing there, you know you found the right thing. But yeah, there are tons and tons of details in that process, too many to sort of go through in a uh, quickie. It's a 21 minute video and it's well carved down. It took me like four hours at the terminal to wow. make it. <laughs> Wait, yeah, <laughs> we'll like, put that link in the description of this one. So yeah, if you're interested in, in doing it the, the really mad way of uh, keeping it vector the whole way and making your life difficult, Ooh. That's, uh, that's where you find out how, but it is, in my opinion, worth it if you have really complex vector art. Glorious. Cool, thank you so much. This is awesome, and I can't wait to watch that video. I can't believe I'd never seen that one before. I, I thought I had even sent it to you because we had talked oh. about it before, yeah. but I was planning to make one because I had worked out a methodology which uh, turned out to be a real sticking point. It took me about two months to figure out how to get complex vector art into wow. evil. Um, and reliably is in air quotes here because like <laughs> and stuff like that, but like to where I could actually get whatever I did in Illustrator into Eagle. So I'm, I'm hoping that that uh, situation is going to improve on Eagle, but until then, this is a workaround that works if you're willing to put in the time. Sweet. Awesome. You rock. Uh, so well, good you. to have you on the show. Thanks again. Have an awesome rest of your day.